All right, welcome to the Fundamental Economic Concepts Review. This review will serve as the first of many reviews for the end of course test exam as well as the AP Macroeconomics exam. These videos are designed to provide you with an overview of these topics, not necessarily to reteach the topics. So let's get started. All right, remember that all of economics begins with the concept of scarcity. Scarcity is a basic problem that human beings are presented with as our wants exceed our limited resources. And also, remember, for something to be scarce, it must be both limited and desirable. So here I have three pictures of items that at one time or another were limited and desirable. LeBron James, clearly one of the better athletes in the world, and presumably every team would like to have a talent like him on their team. The problem is there is only one LeBron James in the world. So remember, again, for something to be scarce, it must be both limited and desirable. The reason we deal with scarcity is the fact that there are limited resources. So in economics, we say that there are four factors of production that are limited and desirable and we use to produce anything that we enjoy in the market today. So there are four factors of production. We have land, labor, capital, and entrepreneurship. Land represents natural resources. An example of land would be oil. Labor represents workers. That is the laborers or human inputs that provide efforts towards production. In this example, we have a cashier at Walmart. Capital can come in many forms, but one of the forms is physical capital. Physical capital represents the machines or the robots that we use to produce goods and services. And here I have an oil rig to represent that. Entrepreneurship represent the business owners or the risk takers in the economy that bring products to the market for sale to the consumers. And here we have a picture of Bill Gates to represent that. One of the fundamental economic concepts that we need to be familiar with is thinking at the margin. A margin is simply a small incremental change. So thinking at the margin is analyzing small decision making. For instance, whether to sleep or study, whether to work or play. Again, thinking at the margin is looking at small decision making and analyzing whether that decision has a marginal benefit that outweighs the marginal cost. So on this particular example, I have a pizza with eight different slices to represent margins. And those margins have both a marginal benefit and a marginal cost. Now, this is different than the analysis of the marginal benefit and marginal cost for a business, but we'll look at that in a moment. But one thing is for sure, I don't want to consume this pizza where the benefit is negative. And based on these numbers, the seventh pizza pizza would probably be negative to me. Here we have a classic example of marginal benefits and marginal costs for a firm. As you can see in this example, we have the decision making of whether to hire additional workers from zero to nine at the margin, the total amount of products they produce, the total they produce at the margin, the price of each unit they produce, the total revenue for the firm, the marginal revenue generated by each person, the marginal revenue generated by each worker, and the cost of each worker. So what we're looking for here is a couple of things. First off, we can see that from workers 0 to 4, there is an increase in the production at the margin. Workers 5 through 7, there's an increase, but their output begins to diminish. And if you notice, from worker 8 and 9, they actually are interrupting the process of production. So we have a negative output here. Okay, so what does this mean for marginal revenue? So I bring myself over here to this column, and I can see that from workers 0 to 4, we are seeing an increase in the marginal revenue per each worker added. The cost of the worker is less than the marginal revenue generated by that worker. Now, you might think, well, the firm should stop hiring at worker 4. However, even though the worker's output begins to diminish at the margin, worker 5 still exceeds the cost. So the marginal benefit still exceeds the cost. Now notice from worker 5 to 6, the marginal revenue is actually equal to the marginal cost. So this does not cost the business anything to hire that worker. However, worker 7, we can see that the marginal revenue is far less than the marginal cost. So from worker 7 
to worker nine, we would not want to add these workers to the business. Now, using that information, we can see that from workers zero to four, we had increasing returns. From workers five to seven, or starting at worker five, we had diminishing marginal returns, and worker eight and nine were negative returns. I'm trying to determine where the marginal costs outweigh the marginal revenue. And I can see that right at this margin, from worker six to seven, we have that scenario. So worker seven causes the marginal costs to outweigh the marginal benefits. Another really important topic in basic economics is that of opportunity cost. The notion of opportunity cost is that there is no such thing as a free lunch. So every time you make a decision, that decision has a cost. And we can measure the cost through what we gave up to do what we did. So opportunity cost formally is defined as the value of the next best alternative decision that we could have made. So in other words, what did we give up? A trade-off is a way of looking at an opportunity cost in the sense that we are compromising between two things. So whether it be work or play, sleep or study, or one product versus another, the opportunity cost measures the cost of the decision that we made. One of the guiding principles in a market system is that of an incentive. Incentives are things that motivate us to do one thing or another, to take one course of action or another. There are many different positive incentives that we see in market economies, but there are also negative incentives. So for instance, when my wife and I first bought a home, we received an $8,000 tax credit from the federal government. This would be known as a positive incentive. Whereas a high tax on a particular product, let's say an excise tax on cigarettes, would be known as a negative incentive or a disincentive to behave in a certain way or not. So here we have several examples here, and we're going to identify the, whether they are positive or negative, as well as the predicted behavior that would be the response of that particular item. So for instance, in the first example, we have an $8,000 tax credit for a home. That would be a positive incentive. And predictably, that would increase the overall home consumption in the United States. A speeding ticket, however, would be a negative incentive or a disincentive, and that would motivate us to maybe drive safer or slower. And if the government subsidizes firms, they are giving them a positive incentive to produce. As mentioned before, a tax on cigarettes would be a negative incentive, and this would be designed to dissuade the market from producing and from purchasing cigarettes. Another important principle of markets and economics in general is that of specialization. Specialization as a concept asserts that we will focus on one task and do it very, very well. For instance, at our school, we have many teachers. Each of those teachers are broken into departments. And furthermore, they are broken into specific subjects. You can see specialization virtually everywhere in a market economy. Also in a market economy is the notion of voluntary exchange. That is, one person focuses on one task, another person focuses on another task, and they trade willingly and freely. Through this trade, both parties are made better off. So whether it be me purchasing gasoline for my car or an individual purchasing food from McDonald's, the customer gets the stuff, the business gets the money, both parties are better off than when they began the transaction. Another notion of fundamental economics is to analyze the difference between various economic systems that exist around the world today. What we can see is that economies have varied over time, but principally are broken up into four different philosophical economic ideologies. The four economic systems are traditional, market, mixed, and command economies, each having different characteristics and examples. So traditional economies are typically how we would view the world through the lens of primitive human beings. Social norms and economic norms were based upon the way things were always done. So we can take tribal existence for this, or maybe modern day people that live in portions of Alaska and choose to live somewhat off the grid or on the land. Market economies are where buyers and sellers determine what is produced, how it's produced, and who it's produced for. And we can see that the best example of Adam Smith's version of, of a market economy is probably Hong Kong whereas the United States 
is a market-based economy with some government interaction. This is known as a mixed economy, where you have private markets with government oversight. Although China is probably our example here, most modern economies do have some form of government regulation. A command economy is where the government is in charge. And today we can see that in countries such as North Korea or Cuba, which although Cuba is moving towards a mixed style economy, they are still largely government ruled. Within each of these economic systems, there are certain economic characteristics. So you can see on this slide, we have five economic characteristics from private ownership to government regulation. Each of these have their own varying characteristics and examples. So private ownership says that in a market economy, I can own property, whether that be physical or intellectual property, a business, a car, a house, or if I create something and I can gain a patent for that product or a copyright for a written text, Nonetheless, I can own property in a market economy. Profit motive is the driving force behind market economies, and that is the ability to make money. So I can work for money. I can sell products for profit. That is a major motivating force in any market economy. Consumers are said to be sovereign in market economies. And what that means is that consumers rule. How do we rule? We rule through our dollar vote. So when we make purchases, those purchases signal to the seller what to produce. Competition is vital for a market economy where we have opposing forces which create price stability and a variety of goods and services in a market economy. And finally, government regulation exists so that the markets behave as they should. When government makes rules, their hand gets bigger in a market. When government reduces rules or deregulates, their hand gets smaller. So a few years back, New York proposed banning certain sized sodas to fight the obesity epidemic. Although this was not passed, this would be a good example of government regulation in a market. Now, we move towards what are called the economic goals and characteristics, which most of these goals allow us to analyze the difference between economic systems. So let's start with economic freedom. Economic freedom is the notion that I can buy and sell freely. I can do what I want with my money. I can do what I want with my life. Now, we know that there's not complete economic freedom in a system like the United States. However, Economic freedom does exist, and if you look at the index, I think the United States is currently right around 12 or 13 in overall economic freedom. Economic security is different than, let's say, police force and defense. This is security in the economy. So these are safety nets that are built into the government, such as unemployment, Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid. These transfer payments help people and citizens when they cannot help themselves or they need some assistance. Economic equity, equity means fair, so in this economy, we have fair work for fair pay. I expect LeBron James to be paid more than I am paid as a teacher. His skill is rarer than my skill and in more demand. Economic growth is measured by gross domestic product, so when we look at gross domestic product, we expect over time to see growth in GDP. Are we producing more today than we did last year? Economic efficiency is the idea that we are going to use our resources to their maximum capacity. And in doing so, we will provide full employment for the economy. So technology, such as Amazon, allows us to produce in a different way, more efficiently, and sometimes even allows us to produce more than we were capable of prior to that point. Price stability is keeping prices, generally speaking, at around 2 to 3% inflation. We don't want prices to go wildly high, and we don't want to see volatility low just a normal increase in price levels so that people can anticipate that inflation. Full employment is the idea that we would have around 5 to 6% normal levels of unemployment. Therefore, around 95% of the economy would be employed. Sustainability is the idea that we would keep our economy progressing without major damage or negative impacts on the environment, society, or culture. Continually providing opportunities for clean energy, air, and water are examples of economic sustainability. All right, now, we mentioned earlier that we have this problem of scarcity. And scarcity essentially says that we don't have enough stuff to satisfy all of the demands of consumers in a market economy or just people in general in the world. So how do we determine who gets the stuff? Well, there are various strategies for how to allocate scarce resources in an economy. The first strategy is price. Simply put, supply and demand. Who gets the stuff is based upon who has the money. 
So you have the money, you get the stuff. The second strategy would be authority. The government, elected officials in a democratic republic, the government officials determine who gets the stuff. In our system here in the United States, Congress, which is elected to make decisions on our behalf, would create and enforce a tax system per se. Therefore, they could redistribute income from one group to another or provide social programs or safety nets in the economy. A historically relevant method of dealing with scarcity is force. So in modern times, the government potentially would mandate what to do when there's a scarcity of resources, such as a military draft in the 1960s and 70s. A fourth strategy is random selection, and a lottery might offer this opportunity. If you've ever tried to wake up on Black Friday, the day after Thanksgiving, and go shopping, you've seen first come, first serve. So if I go to Best Buy to try to buy a TV that's on sale or go to Walmart for some extraordinary deal, whoever shows up first may get the stuff. So again, how do I deal with the fact that we don't have enough stuff? One strategy would be I show up first, I get the stuff. As I mentioned before, in a democratic republic, majority rule is often the way we decide who gets the stuff. So who becomes president? What decisions are made in a state? The voting rights of the majority decide for the overall population. If I look at certain schools or university, personal characteristics often come into play. Who is able to get into a school? So the most qualified individual may get the job, may get into the school, and as a result of scarcity, personal characteristic is often how we determine who gets the stuff. Now earlier in the video I mentioned productivity and specialization as a way to increase productivity. Productivity strictly defined is how much can each person produce. So, if I have better technology and better equipment, that will increase my per capita productivity or my ability to produce. And technically speaking, I can do more with less. Well, inputs are the things that I need to produce the output. So an input is used to produce a final good or service. An output is the final good or service. For instance, an input might be an oven for a pizza shop, while the output would be the pizza. If I have a better oven, I can produce more pizzas. Therefore, productivity allows us to do more with less. There are two forms of capital that we need to be familiar with. One is human capital. Human capital is our ability, our skills, our knowledge. And human capital is just as important as physical capital in the sense that it allows us to be better workers and have the ability to produce more things. Physical capital, on the other hand, represents the machines, the robots, the factories, those inputs that allow us to produce outputs using technology to drive that production. So whereas the machines allow us to produce faster, I also have to know how to use those machines. I have to have the skills necessary to produce with those machines in order to be a better worker. Although we consider ourselves to be a market economy, in the United States we do offer public goods and services through a redistribution of income and correct for market failures when those things occur. So what is a public good? A public good is something the government provides to people. So every Friday, I bring my trash can out to the front of my driveway. And miraculously, when I get home, it's empty. Well, this is a public service that is provided for me from the government. I appreciate that I don't have to bring my garbage to the local dump every week. The way that the government funds this is by taking money through taxes from one group and paying for this service. This is called a redistribution of income. And we can look at three major social programs as a good example of redistribution of income. Welfare, unemployment, and Social Security represent three entitlement programs that take from one group and give to another group in order to fund social programs in the United States. As mentioned before, property rights gives me the ability to own property, whether that be physical or intellectual. Sometimes the market fails and either people cheat or there is not an answer for a problem given a certain set of circumstances in the market. So pollution would be a really good example of a market failure. It's also known as a negative externality, which affects people negatively that aren't involved in the consumption of a product. So if I live near a local paper plant and that local paper plant is dumping chemicals into the water and that water then affects me and my family's ability to access clean water for drinking purposes, that is a negative externality, and the government may step in to correct that problem. In most modern economies, the government regulates certain behavior. So in our country, 
here recently, we have had a series of regulations and deregulations. For example, the government establishes certain standards for automobile production in the United States. They passed legislation that mandated all automobiles have a rear view camera for the purpose of safety. Therefore, in the United States, or cars that are going to be sold to the United States, produced elsewhere, must have this rear view camera. We've also seen many states in the last five to ten years begin to adopt marijuana laws and allow people to use that substance for either medicinal purposes or for recreational purposes. So government, when they create rules, establish new rules. When the government reduces rules or deregulate, they eliminate old policy. The last topic that we'll talk about with fundamental economic concepts is that of the production possibility frontier. This model is designed to show us what happens when we make decisions and how those decisions have costs. So from a very fundamental perspective, a production possibility frontier is essentially just a curve, and that curve represents points that are considered to be efficient or where we are maximizing production. So points A, B, and C represent those efficient use of resources. Sometimes the economy goes into a recession or we have supply shocks, which reduce our ability to produce at the same rate we produced prior to that point. Point of underutilization would be inside the curve here at point D. There are also things that we are incapable of producing currently. Now, someday we may get to that point, but we are currently unable to do that at this moment. This would be point E. Therefore, we look at the production possibility as a potentially dynamic curve that can either go inwards or outwards, representing either a decrease or an increase in resources. Here's a summary of those three scenarios. So we have X, which represents that point inside the curve, which would be an underutilization of resources here at graph A. We have Y, which represents a scenario where we are producing along the curve or with an efficient use of resources. This is represented by graph B. Graph C shows us that unattainable point, which we are outside this curve and we are unable to produce at point Z until we have better technology and resources to produce. So the production possibility frontier, while a simple curve, does illustrate the difference in our ability to produce at a maximum level, underperform, or where we may be able to get in the future but we simply cannot get to now. Here's an example of a production possibility frontier model and the production possibility points from A to E. And what we'll see as we graph this curve, so we're going to go ahead and bullet point these points, connect the dots for our PPF, is that as we produce more of one good, this will cost us the production of the other good. So for instance, as I move from margin A to margin B, I increase production of hugs, therefore I get one more hug, but I have to give up some of these high fives. So where I was able to produce 30 high fives at bullet point A, at bullet point B, I can only produce 29. Therefore, I gave up one at the margin. From bullet point B to bullet point C, or from margin B to C, I gain another hug, but here I have to give up four high fives at the margin. And again, what I'm seeing here is as I'm producing more of one, I'm giving up some of the other. Now, I can work this either way. I can go from hugs to high fives or high fives to hugs. So if I go from E to D, I am increasing my high fives by 15, but I am having to give up one hug. And finally, I am increasing my high fives by five, but I am sacrificing my hugs by two. So the production possibility model allows us to see conceptually what our economy is capable of producing when we are on the curve, inside the curve, or outside the curve, and allows us to see per unit opportunity cost as we look through these graphs. This concludes the fundamental portion of our review, and a follow-up video here will show us microeconomics. So thank you for watching, and we progress forward to microeconomics.